Kollegid alustame päeva teise. Kolleg, let move on to the second section. Jaak Madison ja Euroopa Liidu asjade komissioni ase esim. This session will be moderated by Jaak Madison, Vice Chair of the EU Affairs Committee of the Estonian Parliament. Thank you, Thomas. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jaak Madison. And in addition to being a Vice Chair of the EU Affairs Committee of the Estonian Parliament, I'm also a member of the Constitutional Affairs Committee of our Parliament. And I am also the youngest member of the Estonian Parliament. I am very glad to be the moderator of our last but not least session. We are, uh, we have an opportunity to exchange thoughts on the topic of migration and more specifically on preventing and fighting illegal, illegal migration. Effective migration policy entails actions both within the EU as well as contributing in third countries. I'm very glad to say that the EU has made serious efforts and our crisis response has been replaced by comprehensive migration policy. However, there is a problem uh, that lies in mo the modest number of returns of persons who do not need protection. So this is an area where we expect the thoughts from all of you. But before we start our debate, please allow me to introduce the speakers of this session. We have three of them. Our first keynote speaker is Mr. Simon Mordu from the European Commission. The second presenter is Mr. Edward Zamit lewis from the House of Representatives of Malta, and he will be followed by Anne-Marie Virolainen from the Parliament of Finland. As during all the previous sessions, we will be listening to the speakers first, then you have the opportunity to intervene from the floor, and at the end of the session, I will hand the floor back to the speakers to comment and answer any questions that have been asked. So as from now, you may register for interventions. As you know, you can do this electronically by pushing a button on your conference unit. And now I'm glad to give the floor to the first speaker. Mr. Simon Mordieu is uh, the Deputy Director General for Migration in the Director General for Migration and Home Affairs of the European Commission, and he manages the Directorates of Migration and Protection and Migration and Security Funds. And he has also worked for the uh, Director General uh, that is dealing with uh, neighborhood policy and accession negotiations. Um, I'd like to pick off where Julian left in the last session and give you a sense of um, some of what has happened over the last couple of years in this area of the external dimension of migration. Let me start by just setting it in context. I think the numbers we saw arriving in Europe in 2015-2016 constituted probably the biggest migration crisis we'd had to deal with in Europe uh, since the Second World War. I think we're beginning to see the results of a comprehensive strategy now paying off. If we look at the figures in 2017, we've seen a 60% drop in the number of irregular arrivals in the European Union compared to what we saw in 2016. The EU-Turkey statement, while it's been a bit under pressure in the last couple of months, is still holding. So we've seen a replacement of up to 10,000 irregular arrivals a night now with, on average, just over 80 a day since the EU-Turkey statement, Turkey statement was activated. On the central Mediterranean route, an awful lot of work took place over this summer, which has now seen a fairly spectacular drop in the number of arrivals coming over the central Mediterranean route into Italy. Uh, as we speak today, we're at 32% lower than we were at this time last year. Um, a lot of this has been done through uh, action together, hand in hand with the member states. 
A lot of it has also been about putting in place a comprehensive strategy that brings together both the internal dimension and the external dimension. I'll focus primarily on the external dimension today, given the focus of this session, but let me nevertheless just pick up what Julian said, two examples of what we've done on the internal side that's really made a big difference. The creation of the European Border and Coast Guard Agency, with the creation of reserve pools of 1,700 Border Guard officials who can be deployed at any moment in time. Um, we've also got the Schengen Information System, with over 3 million consults uh, uh, last year, so really beginning to to make a, a difference. Um, if I look on the external side, we've obviously got the EU-Africa Summit this week, which comes very timely. I think this is an opportunity for us to have with our African partners a, a fairly frank discussion, an open discussion on this. Um, on our side, I think we have to recognise migration is not going away. So one of the challenges is, do we view migration as a threat or do we view migration as an opportunity? And I think this is the challenge. How can we put in place a robust system that allows us to manage migration and ensure that we have orderly flows rather than the kind of disorderly flows that we saw in 2015 and 2016? I start by saying that I think there is still broad consensus that Europe should continue to be a, a leading global actor in offering protection and refuge to those who are in need. If I look at the figures in 2016, the European Union offered some 720,000 refugees protection and asylum. That's three times more than the combined total of Australia, Canada and the US together. But I think one of our challenges is we should not be having people needing to risk their lives or pay a smuggler to arrive and benefit from protection in the European Union. So our challenge is how can we incentivize people not to follow that pathway and instead look to follow legal channels. And one of the things we're doing at the moment is working with all of the member states to put in place um, a resettlement scheme that will allow people who need protection have been designated as genuine refugees by the UNHCR to reach the European Union directly. This is much better for member states. You have much more control over who is coming. The security and health checks can be performed before they arrive. And we've had a fairly good reaction to the call we launched um, a couple of months ago where we called for member states to pledge up to 50,000 uh, resettlement places. And to date, 18 member states have responded. And we've had an offer of some 38,000 resettlement pledges. I think the same is true for economic migration. We still need economic migrants. I think the challenge we have, though, is how can we do this in an orderly way? Last year, the European Union offered something like 3.3 million um, residence permits to citizens from outside the European Union. What we've not often done is brought this into a holistic um, gameplay, using this as part of a relationship with our third countries to also make sure that they work in areas where we need support from them. I'm thinking in particular of return and readmission. Our track record in this area is pretty poor. If I look at the figures over the last 12 months, I think something like only one third of all people who have had a return decision issued against them have effectively been able to be returned to their countries of origin. And I think this is a real problem because while I, I do believe that many of our citizens are willing to see refugee status granted to those who are genuinely in need of protection, there is a degree of frustration that our systems don't seem to be able to make a credible difference between people who are coming only as economic migrants and people who genuinely need such protection. So this is an area where I think we have much, much more to do. It's about, I think, looking at the interaction between the asylum process and the return process. It's about making sure that decisions are taken in a timely manner. It's about making sure that return decisions can actually be executed. I think some of our ideas here involve really turning the European Border and Coast Guard Agency into a kind of logistical arm of the European Union that can support member states in return operations. And I do think occasionally we are going to have to get a bit sharper here with some of our African partners. Uh, return of irregularly arriving citizens is an international obligation. It, it's 
uh, enshrined in the Cotonou agreements. So we need to make sure that our African partners are also accepting to take back their citizens who've moved irregularly. And the picture's not great. You look at a country like Mali, a return rate of about 4.5%, Senegal under 10%. And this is where I think we've got to get a bit sharper, because uh, otherwise I think we are genuinely going to risk losing the space for protection within the European Union. Our citizens will not carry it when we're not able to make this distinction. If I turn to the EU Africa Summit this week, I wanted just to flag one point which has been very present in the news over the last few weeks, and this is the horrendous situation in Libya. I think it's very, very important that we don't allow the European Union to be presented as a, being as the source of these horrible camps in Libya. These camps have existed for many, many years. Uh, and actually, in contrast to many partners, we've been doing an awful lot of work to try and actually improve on the ground the conditions in Libya. Over 15,000 people have been evacuated from Libya with our support, with the IOM, to, to return to their home countries. Uh, we've been now, together with UNHCR, looking to... Um, emergency evacuate people out of Libya who need protection, who can then go to the European Union on resettlement. But I think it's equally important that the African Union take these concerns seriously and the unacceptable uh, situation be uh, condemned together. Um, we're also doing an awful lot of work on helping to tackle the root causes of migration with our African partners. We've put in place over the last couple of years um, trust funds uh, to support um, socio-economic development and sharper border management in, within our uh, African partners with over some €2 billion Euro available there. And we've also put in place now a, a very ambitious external investment plan which looks to take grant funding from the European Union, uh, blend it with um, um, loans from the international financing institutions and the private sector funding and can potentially put in place um, some 44 billion euro of development funding, private sector development funding in Africa over the next few years. So I think the challenge is continuing to view migration from a holistic point of view, doing everything we can to replace the irregular disorderly flows with orderly flows and becoming ever tougher as well in attacking the business model of the smugglers and really uh, working with our African partners to bring order into this area. It's not an easy challenge, it's a difficult one, it's one that will accompany us for the next 10 or 15 years, but where I think we have seen the first um, signs of light at the end of the tunnel and we're beginning to see progress. The last element that I think is still really needed is a robust common European asylum system. Um, there's a lot of work still to be done on that to deliver uh, the, what the leaders are now calling for, which is an agreement by um, next June. I think that is the last missing piece of the puzzle that will allow us to have in place a, a crisis-proof system fit for the good days as well as fit for the bad days. Sorry, as well as the good days. Um, I'll end there, keeping to my time limit, and I'm sure we'll have plenty of opportunity for questions, answers, and a lively debate later. Thank you very much. So, Mordiu. Thank you, Mr. Mordiu. I am now glad to introduce our next speaker of the session, Mr. Edward Zamet Lewis. He is the chairman of the Foreign and Affairs, European Affairs Committee of the House of Representatives of Malta. He was elected to the Maltese Parliament in 2013 and he was uh, the Parliamentary Secretary for Competitiveness and Growth until April 2018. He's also the former Tourism Minister of Malta. Mr. Edward Zamit lewis please. Good morning. Thank you, Jack. And I thank the Estonian Presidency for this opportunity on such an important subject, which is migration, a subject which is important for Europe, for its member states, for a small country like Malta and even for neighboring uh, non-EU member states, if we take, as we have to take, a holistic approach. Migration is not going away. The irregular passage of persons will remain with us. The irregular passage of persons searching for a better life is there to stay. It is up to us that we do something about it and we handle the situation in a smarter manner. We, we all agree that return readmission agreements and other relevant legal channels are central elements of any effective cooperation in migration matters. 
We need to reach a point where migrants can treat legal options available to them as a credible alternative to a regular migration, which gives rise, as uh, Mr. Mordu just mentioned, to uh, the flourishing of organized crime. Strengthening legal channels for refugees to achieve protection and safety would contribute to reducing the number of migrant lives lost at sea and the many abuses perpetrated by smuggling networks. The EU resettlement framework proposed by the Commission in July last year is certainly a step in the right direction, but it needs, however, in my opinion, to be adopted as soon as possible. Resettlement is one of the preferred options for granting safe and lawful access to the Union for refugees and those in need of international protection. The new scheme to resettle at least 50,000 of the most vulnerable refugees, in particular along the central Mediterranean route, by October 2019 is another positive, yet temporary, solution. Turning to return and readmission, I am pleased to note that a number of agreements have been actually concluded. However, the application of an effective return and re readmission agreement remains limited, and in some cases, non-existent. Every year, around half a million foreign nat nationals are ordered to leave the Union because they have entered or are residing within the Union regularly. However, only 40% are sent back to their home country or to their original point of departure towards the EU. So why is it the case and what should be done? One may question. Readmission of a country's own nationals is an obligation, as already mentioned, under international law. However, cooperation amongst states is still lacking, despite efforts at European Union level aimed at enabling countries of origin to implement this obligation. At a national level, I can say that my country, Malta, signed memorandum of understanding on migration-related matters with Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Gambia, and the Maltese government is currently in active discussions with other nations. However, more needs to be done to implement an effective and, I would say, a humane return policy as an integral element of the EU's comprehensive and longer-term approach to addressing migration and mobility. There needs to be more readmission agreements endorsed with countries of origin. We need to start from countries from where the highest percentage of migrants originate. For example, within the first half of, of the year 2017, through the Central African route, the top five nationalities arriving to Europe via Central Mediterranean were Nigeria, Guinea, Bangladesh, Ivory Coast, and Mali, as already mentioned. It is therefore important to conclude readmission agreements with such countries for the return policy to be considered as truly effective. We also need to invest in legal channels of mobility, such as the provision of scholarships, grants, and job opportunities for research, whilst assisting in the development of new skills for these persons, it is imperative that once the term of stay is over, migrants return to their home countries, taking back with them and disseminating the skills they developed during their stay with us, thus limiting the brain, drain, the brain drain from countries of origin and promoting a concept of an opposite concept of a, a new brain gain. We also need to step up our efforts on voluntary return. The efforts and results in assisting voluntary return from third countries, such as Libya, a neighboring country with a very unstable situation, are very positive. And we need to continue with our cooperation with organizations such as IOM, UNHCR, UNICEF, and others to improve the appalling conditions faced by, by migrants in Libya. Return and readmission are clearly two valid channels in which more effort and work needs to be directed by all of us in order to reduce the number of illegal crossings. 
It is evident that for us to have a successful EU external migration policy, we need to move away from a crisis management, and I would say a, re a reactive approach, to the promotion of a framework of long-term policies, in my opinion, based on four main pillars, which I would list and uh, conclude my intervention. Number one, efficient prevention, a preventive approach of irregular flows. Number two, reliable systems, reliable and consistent, consistent systems of returns. Number three, common shouldering of the responsibility of a common external borders, wherein everyone will pool uh, resources in this direction and for a common and effective common external border. And finally, the establishment of a stable framework of, for resettlement. Thank you very much, and I hope uh, we will discuss uh, these issues and um, these matters further with, with your valid and valuable interventions. Thank you very much. So, right, Dahar Lewis. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. And our last speaker in this section is Ms. Anne-Marie Virolainen. Uh, chairman of the Grand Committee of the Finnish Parliament. Um, she's been MP in the Finnish Parliament starting from 2007. She's been member of various committees and delegations, such as Constitutional Affairs Committee and the Nordic Council, Council of Europe, and uh, the Finnish delegation to the IPU. In addition to her parliamentary activity, Ms. Virolainen has held various posts in local authorities and also NGOs working in the fields of health, welfare and youth affairs. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Mordu and Mr. Jamit Lewis for your presentation. I would also like to thank the chair for bringing this important and yet difficult and dividing topic under discussion. To celebrate the upcoming 100th Independence Day of my home country, I shall continue my intervention in my mother tongue, Finnish. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I um, uh, think that we need a comprehensive approach to migration policy uh, in order uh, for policy to be effective. Uh, we have done a lot to uh, boost uh, the EU migration policies both internally and externally. However, I still feel we need to do more uh, as uh, our, the extent of our action on financing are still insufficient. I completely endorse the previous speakers in that we need a comprehensive approach um, uh, for migration policy to be effective. We need to keep the big picture in mind. Under development, demographic structures, lack of opportunities, climate change, inequalities, wars, violence, poverty, there are no short-term solutions for these. So it is clear that major migration flows will remain with us for years to come. It is our moral obligation to keep basic rights and international obligations in the center of our migration policy. If we set aside our basic values to gain short-term advantages, we give up on Europe as a community of values, and we can't afford to do that. Mr. Mordu uh, mentioned that we indeed um, need to help those in need of international protection and identify the most vulnerable persons. We need more legal and safe paths to Europe. It is uh, better that people seek a safer life in a controlled way, for instance, through resettlement schemes. We need to make these schemes more efficient and uh, better accepted in all member states. We also uh, need to work together with the IOM and the UNHCR in order to improve the humanitarian condition in the migration routes. Recent news are truly alarming, um, if not downright abhorrent. Uh, slavery has arrived to our neighboring areas, as for instance, people in detention camps in Libya are treated like slaves. We mustn't turn a blind eye to such developments. We also must do something about human trafficking, uh, but uh, we are intervening on the consequence, not the root cause. Migration is like a flood. Dams can only work in the short term, and they are not perfect. We need to look for long-term solutions that address the underlying causes. 
Addressing the root causes is indeed the best way to restrict unmanageable migration flows. As we all know, people sometimes leave their homes because of poverty and violent conflicts, but sometimes just in, uh, to seek uh, better living conditions. Therefore, the key is to help the economic and democratic development of countries of origin with special emphasis on Africa as equal partners. If uh, uh, on, there's only 14 kilometers of difference between uh, Europe and Africa, so it is um, in our interest to help uh, growth and prosperity in Africa. If there's instability in Africa, there will be instability in Europe. Giving aid to development is our obligation, but it is not um, enough. The EU external investment program is a step in the right direction, but at the same time we have to change the global game to create opportunities for trade and investment. The EU has to review its trade policies in order to open up its own markets. All in all, it is important to ensure uh, the coherence of EU's external policies, especially development, trade and migration policies need to be joined up so they work together and boost the objectives of the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, such as poverty eradication, curbing climate change, uh, and improving gender equality by bolstering women's and girls' rights and opportunities. Uh, and in this respect, the EU is key as the USA have changed tack. The more we can achieve in the external dimension of our migration policy, the less we need EU internal action to manage the situation. Our internal systems need nonetheless to be effective so we can rapidly integrate those who have the right to stay in Europe while identifying those who pose a security threat to our society. As for returns, uh, the best and most humane and organized option, as far as uh, this is concerned, uh, is um, offered by uh, voluntary subsidized returns. Uh, we need extensive cooperation between the migrants, civil society and authorities in countries of origin, transit and destination alike. Readmission agreements play an important role here. We also need to draw up an EU list of safe countries. Both internal and external action in migration require money. In the future negotiations on the MFF, we need to ensure that this is taken into account. We need to direct funds especially to addressing the root causes of migration. We also need to improve coordination between the different financial facilities. To conclude, I would like to point out that migration policy decisions have an impact on the debate of the future of the EU, uh, which has been a topic in this meeting too. Decisions taken in my migration policy will certainly play a part in the future development of the EU, uh, whether that development can be harmonious or not. If we s fail to sing from the same hymn sheet, um, we can face uh, a Europe of variable ge geometry, or we may even have to dismantle uh, achieve, um, achieved uh, progress in integration. Um, how people see the EU will largely hinge on results achieved in migration policy. Thank you to all our speakers for sharing your valuable ideas with us, colleagues. Now we can start our debate and listen to your statements and questions to our speakers. We have about 45 minutes for this debate and 24 delegates have asked for the floor. Every delegate has one and a half minutes of speaking time. Please stick to this speaking time in order to give everyone an opportunity to speak. And first, I'm glad to give the floor to Ms. Tineke Streek from the Netherlands, please. Thank you very much, Chair, and also thanks to the panelists for their uh, contributions. For the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, I'm currently Rapporteur on the human rights aspects of migration deals. And in that respect, there are still a lot of questions and concerns, uh, as Mrs. Ferreilen uh, also uh, mentioned. The impact 
is that migrants and refugees are stranded in transit countries or sent back to their, these countries, also if those countries still lack a proper asylum system or even sometimes effective human rights. For instance, the EU pays the Libyan Coast Guard to bring back migrants to Libya, where we know that they risk grave human rights violations. Now, the Commissioner uh, rightly stated that the EU uh, uh, invests in a lot of improvement measures, but these measures do not have an immediate effect, whereas border controls do. So we, the uh, impact is that people face these violations over there. And Libya may be an extreme case, but my question to the Commission, applies to many more countries, as uh, also in other countries, uh, many refugees do not receive the full protection of the Refugee Convention. So my question is, how does the EU ensure that the external dimension abides by fundamental rights? And shouldn't we make sure first, before we enter into cooperation, that these rights are ensured over there? In what way are human rights leading in the external dimension? For instance, in selecting the countries of cooperation, in applying human rights as a conditionality for cooperation, or in considering suspension mechanisms or independent monitoring systems? Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, Ms. Marina Berlingeri, Italy. Thank you. Managing migration on the cent along the central Mediterranean route is uh, something involving many partnerships. Various measures have been undertaken by Italy and the EU in Africa are starting to bear fruit. However, the European action to reduce the basic causes of migration do need to be sped up indeed. We need global restructuring and we also have to take on board human rights, but no country is able to manage this phenomenon on its own. We have the migration compact. In particular, we need to involve relations with the countries of origin, countries of transit, in attempts to uh, gain cooperation of these countries with Europe. We also need to consolidate the political, economic and institutional bases in these countries to ensure that uh, people no longer wish to leave these countries and they have a more favorable outlook of life back home. Uh, anybody who is aware of all the strategies of uh, these can see how hard it is to cooperate with countries who are going through strong phases of huge destabilization at the moment. Uh, there is also corruption. These risks should not, however, uh, should not move away from the only strategy that can help to manage migratory flows, otherwise they be, may become unmanageable and unsustainable. We need a long-term view and we need fundamental investment of huge scope within the cultural sector. We need programs for mobility which are targeted at use to stimulate new productive activities in this country, new entrepreneurial activities. We need cultural exchanges and university level exchanges. Such solutions should be born, uh, should be underpinned by programming capacity and uh, economic Economic resources far greater than have been dedicated to it thus far. We have to bear in mind that the programs of assistance to the UNA, to the African states uh, take an awful lot of time to get off the ground and to bring about genuine improvements for the living conditions that we have in the countries that are the origins of these major flows of migrants. Thank you. Next, Ms. Concepcion de Santa Ana, Spain. Gracias, Presidente. Thank you very much, Chair. Now, this is a very complex debate, and I would like to focus on protection that is uh, needed by all uh, child migrants. You had uh, these crises, and the number of child migrants that arrived in Europe over the last few years has grown exponentially, and many of these child migrants arrive without a family. We need to strengthen protection of all these migrant children in all phases of the process. I believe this is a fundamental duty of the European Union. We need to ensure that uh, they be identified when they arrive and that they be properly processed. So uh, we need to ensure that uh, they are dealt with by qualified personnel. We need to give them sustainable perspectives in the future and education, health care, and we need to ensure that uh, we can find where their families are in the countries of origin, and we need to ensure that we can integrate them and give them better protection, and we need to work uh, better with all the various different services. Migration is a very complex debate, obviously. We need to draw a distinction between the economic causes 
and then those people who are um, entitled to international protection. So we need to take a very broad approach and uh, causes are vital. The cause of this migration is obviously vital, but I really want to focus on young people, the most vulnerable of these migrants, and we need to know what the Commission feels about everything that's being done in this regard. Thank you very much. Right then. Thank you. Next, uh, Mr. Piotr Poland. Thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, all the presenters uh, for very nice uh, and interesting presentations. <laughs> Uh, I would also like to say that I agree very much with the point presented by the uh, Anne-Marie Virulainen. I think the long-term uh, problems are among the most important. And among them, I would like to stress the rapidly growing population in Africa and in Middle East. Uh, of course, counteracting, assisting countries to limit the, uh, this rapid growth of population is extremely difficult. But I think that besides the wars and, confl and military conflicts, it is the most, in most difficult, difficult and most uh, important problem which is driving people in Europe in an orderly way. So if we don't do that, the legal measures we are working on and even fences will not stop in the future people in coming uh, uh, in Europe completely out of order and out, out of the things we are working on presently. Uh, so I would like uh, to uh, ask to think about this problem of, let's say, assisting and promoting limitation of population in the countries which can't do that by themselves and even internally. I think it is a very difficult problem for them. Thank you. All right, then. Thank you. Next, uh, Mr. Gerard Crowell, Ireland. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, I would first start off by thanking those countries on the Mediterranean that are facing this uh, problem on a daily basis and uh, congratulate them on the work they're doing. I visited uh, Palizzo in Sicily and saw firsthand the crisis. Um, However, I come from Ireland, and Ireland claims to have 70 million people worldwide as part of our diaspora. So we're well used to migration, and we've been doing it for quite some time. The problem facing us today is that we must separate out refugee status from migration status. Too many for too long have been referred to as refugees coming into Europe. I've, I have seen these people, strong, fit, young men, arriving, claiming to be refugees. Let's be honest with one another here. It is not racist to turn around and say these people are not refugees, they are economic migrants. With that in mind, we must put strategies in place that will deal with the migration, the economic migration issues. And one of the things we must do is look at the global corporate world, who move to cheap economies to get cheap labour, but what do they contribute while they're there? Very little. They take their uh, super normal profits because we don't see any reduction in prices on the high street. So we've got to tackle that. We've got to see these companies invest in the communities they're in. With respect to short-term uh, visas for the transferring of skills, I would fully support that and I believe my, my country would also support it. Um, the, the aid to developing countries. For too long we have seen aid going into countries and that aid being siphoned off by corrupt uh, politicians, corrupt organisations. If we're going to provide aid, we need to do it direct. Perhaps we should look at developing schools and training centres funded by the EU in these countries. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I won't go any further. Thank you. Next, um, Mr Andrius Kubilius, Lithuania. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr Chair. Dear colleagues, when EU was born back in 1957, Jean Monnet have said, EU will be created in crisis situations and will be the sum of the solutions adopted in periods of crisis. During a recent migration crisis, we saw that Monnet was absolutely right in his prediction. It's good that we learned some lessons from a recent refugees and migration crisis. Really, we learned how to be much more effective defending our southern borders the Commission is announcing a Marshall Plan with Africa and readiness to invest around 40 billion euros into economies of Africa in order to tackle the roots of the problems. I hope that we shall understand also that it is better to import agricultural products in a much more 
intense way from North Africa, from the whole Africa, into EU markets instead of importing terrorism from that region. But for me, the most important question is very simple. Can we change that tendency, which Monet predicted, that we are reacting only when the crisis is hitting us? Can we have proper policies which would allow us to react in advance to prevent the crisis, the crisis to happen? Now we have common policy how to strengthen our borders in the south, because we were hit by the crisis. But do we have common policy how to strengthen our borders in the east with Russia? In the Baltics, we are strengthening that border on our own. But we do not see common policy or common European resources spent for that purpose. We see Marshall Plan for Africa, but uh, where is Marshall Plan for Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova? Still, it is only a Lithuanian initiative supported by European Parliament. So let's try to change Jean Monnet prediction. All right, then. Thank you, colleagues. I have to close the speakers list now. We have 20 speakers now left. Stefan Schenner is next, please. Thank you, Schenner. Thank you, Chairman. We're speaking about migration. It's a bit different to Ireland. I would highlight that there are refugees and the Geneva Convention came about, and that there's migration. And that's why you have migration legislation. But there are very different legal provisions. And irregular is uh, migration, but uh, we have 100,000 people who have fleeing wars, others fleeing uh, for uh, on emergency grounds. But we have concluded con conventions with two countries where there aren't very high um, human rights bases, Turkey and Libya. So we have to do everything to uh, deal with the causes why people are leaving in Somalia, Nigeria and Pakistan. It's important that we are aware that uh, places such as al Sattari in Jordan uh, will or need to be towns and that we need to ensure that we provide assistance to the Lebanon where a third of the population are refugees. So we need more uh, secure circumstances for uh, women and children in such camps so that uh, Europe continues to be a defender of human rights and welcoming at the same time. Thank you. Next, Mr. Tibor Bona from Hungary. Colleagues, Europe is still under heavy migratory pressure. The uncontrolled inflow of illegal migrants brings significant security risks. It is indispensable to control the migration flow and prevent that potential terrorists abuse the right to and the process of determining the need for international protection. The EU finally realized that defending our borders and helping to solve the problems within the countries of origin are the most important tools to reduce and hopefully end this migration flow. However, this is a long-term problem, so we need to come up with a solution which we can sustain or even improve in the coming years. We also need to strike harder on migrant smugglers and put more emphasis on closing the smuggling routes. This needs a closer collaboration among the security forces of the EU member states and the forces of countries of origin and transit. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Mr. David Stelina, Malta, please. Yeah, it's working now. Just speak. Thank you, Chair. Reliable and very informed sources say that there are actually thousands of migrants waiting to cross to Europe from North Africa. Of course, it's very hard to gauge the extent of the problem because, of course, this is a problem. Now, on the 14th of November, the European Commission expressed cautious optimism, especially in terms of the arrivals from 
from North Africa to Europe along the central Mediterranean route. Now, <clears throat> I think it's important to recognize there, that we actually still face massive challenges, especially in the central Mediterranean route. Let's not be complacent. I was particularly happy with, uh, with uh, beefing up of Frontex, European border guards. And I'd like to see the, the beefing up of the uh, asylum agency based in Malta and um, an agreement on the list of, of uh, countries of origin, um, all steps in the right direction. But we must focus more on the root causes of migration. And this is what the, the joint uh, Valletta Action Plan seeks to do. Now, all countries from north to south, east to west in Europe, all agreed and supported this Valletta Action Plan. But now we need to make sure that we follow it up with concrete measures. Thank you. Sure, Adam. Thank you, Mr. Tunne Kelam from the European Parliament. Thank you, Chair. I would like to express my sympathy and solidarity with our Maltese colleagues first, who experienced more than 10 years ago the arrival of irregular migrants into their small island. And I think it's high time to change the rigid rules of the Dublin system. But uh, we are all for regular migration. What we don't want, obviously, is that migration could be perceived as a threat to our identity and security of many European citizens. And uh, this is where populist movements are thriving upon. Even two years ago in Germany, it became obvious that there's a limit to further migration for the time being. Second, I think migration cannot be perceived as a substitute for not producing children of our own. And third observation is about Syrian crisis and refugees. I think the European Union has performed the role of Good Samaritan, taking care of the results of the crisis instead of addressing the roots of the crisis. And we are not seen even today in political solution about Syria. I think this is a, a, a problem for European common uh, foreign and security policy. And third, last observation is that we need to have neglected to strike systematically on human traffickers because absolute majority of migrants arrive through paying at least $1,000 to traffickers, and this money is going to finance terrorists. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the excellent interventions to all uh, the speakers. As we know, uh, in 2015-2016, the EU was completely surprised uh, when thousands of people uh, came over the Schengen borders. Uh, there were th people who um, were seeking better living conditions, but uh, these people comprised also some criminals. We need uh, shared decisions and we need strong commitments from each and every member state to the these common decisions. Uh, we need to be able to identify uh, people in need of uh, protection uh, and, and dif distinguish them from other uh, people trying to get into the EU. Uh, those who uh, exploit uh, people through criminal uh, ways uh, are engaging in abhorrent activities. Um, we need returns and we need a list of sh an EU list of sh safe countries and we need to uh, stick to these decisions. Uh, we need to uh, respect uh, the uh, fundamental EU values and international conventions. Thank you. Uh, distinguished Chair, dear colleagues. Just like many other European countries, since 2015, the Republic of Serbia has been facing constant mass migration inflow and transit of migrants through its territory. For the past two and a half years, we have been in a specific position. 
On the main Western Balkan migration route and the challenges we have been facing have frequently surpassed our capacities. Since the beginning of the migration crisis, the government of the Republic of Serbia has chosen a proactive approach in order to ensure adequate protection and assistance to those in distress and show the willingness to responsibly face the situation. On the other hand, there is a need to protect our citizens against the migration flow. To put it shortly, it is necessary to wade into and solve constant problems that cause concerns about human rights of migrants and refugees and of the local population as well. Migration crisis, besides the problems of humanitarian nature, also carries the challenges related to inf infiltration of those who might pose terrorist threats. We have invested great efforts in enhancing border control and preventing criminal activities of human smuggling and trafficking. Chain implementation of measures agreed by the countries on the Western Balkan route in the beginning of March 2016 has led to closure of this route. However, there is still a certain number of migrants who enter the Republic of Serbia illegally now with the assistance of smugglers. The problem facing Serbia primarily refers to the increasing number of irregular, uh, irregular migrants as regard previous three months. Moreover, another problem is the fact that the Republic of Serbia is not an EU member state, which means it does not have access to EU funds aimed at tackling migration. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, and sincerely ask the colleagues to stick to the time, because otherwise we need to reduce the intervention time to one minute. Please stick to one and a half minutes. So now, Herr Zoltan Tesseli from Hungary. Chair, dear colleagues, I'm a mayor of a Hungarian small town and an MP. And in that town, um, between 1989 and 2016, we had the largest reception center. So I plea and I ask you to uh, separate uh, refugees from economic migrants. I say it out of experience, those who uh, burst into our homes and destroy our walls and doors are not people who are in need of help. They are simply perpetrating crimes against our communities. Um, in the town of Bicke, since 2002, what we have seen is that about 2% were exposed to dangers in their original countries. And that 2% does not receive adequate attention or resources because the remaining 98% uh, consumes all the attention and the resources, and this is not okay. Much is being said these days about the reform of the asylum system. However, this can only come after we are compliant with our most important rules, and notably the protection of our external borders. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Konstantinos Estatio, Cyprus, please. Dear colleagues, I find it impossible to express in just 90 seconds uh, an issue such uh, of such importance, humanitarian, political, and so on. Of course, it's better to have 90 seconds than having 60 seconds or no time at all, as my friend and colleague just said. So this approach, uh, spending a few seconds on such an important topic, uh, is proof of our reluctance over time to discuss serious issues to do with human rights, issues that involve uh, human beings, uh, hopes, and visions. And that's why I want to say a few words in French, uh, the language of human rights, about our reluctance to take seriously uh, these issues. We need to have dreams. We need to have hopes. They disappear under the dark skies of a Europe that is illusory. It's far removed and it's a dis deception. Thank you. Next, Mr. Lignan, from France. Thank you very much, Chair, dear colleagues. 
Europe needs to face up to a difficult challenge. How do we organize a migratory policy in a, on a long-term basis rather than reacting uh, to the crisis that we face? We need to organize a global migratory policy. We need to have a partnership and a shared responsibility. Just as Mr. Macron said in his Sorbonne speech, our European policy should not see uh, Africa as a threatening neighbor, but a strategic partner. And together, we need to face up to the challenge of tomorrow, youth employment, mobility, climate change, technological revolutions. But the first priority is to discourage mafias that are prospering off the backs of human beings. How can Frontex play a better role in tackling this? How can the EU find coercive tools in order to tackle this phenomenon? The returns policy, sending people back to their country's uh, migrants, is the weak point of the EU. What we need to do is we need to look in to the returns procedures, which are ineffective. And we need to be pragmatic while at the same time respecting fundamental rights. Mutual recognition of return decisions between member states, as suggested by the European Commission in March 2017, should allow us to accelerate return procedures and to discourage non-authorized secondary movement within the EU. We also need to uh, uh, um, intensify uh, actions to encourage um, ret a voluntary return and to uh, help these people reintegrate into their societies. Thank you. Next, Lech Kolakowski from Poland. Mr. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it is good to re uh, remind here uh, what our foreign minister, Mr. Vyashchikovsky, uh, said. There were uh, irresponsible politicians who invited the migrants here. Now we have hundreds of thousands of migrants that have not been identified. Many un unaccompanied uh, minors are just uh, lost. and. Even the rich German economy is not capable of welcoming all these people. Uh, it, Poland is uh, very responsible in this respect. We are controlling our uh, uh, eastern uh, border. We have issued 1,200,000 visas to Ukrainians. They are working legally in Poland. So we should uh, solve these conflicts, the uh, root of these problems in the countries of origin in order to combat this illegal migration. Uh, refugees from uh, Turkey and uh, Syria and Lebanon should remain what they are. Uh, who said that refugees from these countries are more important refugees from Ukraine? We should also open our borders to those who are fleeing Donbass or Crimea. We are also ready uh, to uh, support various missions, Frontex missions and EU and NATO missions. But all these missions should be coordinated, they should be sensible, and they should stem migration and not reinforce the flows. I would like to oppose the policy of some European leaders in the field of uh, migration. This led to uh, terrorist attacks, uh, rapes, and other crimes. Thank you. Mark Angel, Luxembourg. Mark Angel, Luxembourg. Chair, I just want to recall that 90% of all refugees and displaced people in the world are uh, welcomed in developing countries. Just to remind that, uh, when we discuss this subject, this important subject, we always talk about uh, fighting the root causes. So economic development of Africa comes up. So the EU Commission came up with the External Investment Fund, which I think is an excellent initiative. And it ha also has the 2.7 billion euro Africa Trust Fund. But I want to remind uh, President Juncker speech in September, State of the Union, where he uh he remi reminded us that uh, member states all combined have only contributed 150 million to this fund and that this fund is reaching its limits. So I just call to all my colleagues when we vote, when you vote your budgets, just check when you plead here for uh, fighting root causes, just check if your country is uh, contributing to this uh, fund. The same is uh, official uh, development aid is going down in many countries. The new consensus of development is worse than the one we had in 2005. 
So uh, uh, that's also I call on you to check uh, official development aid. Our Polish friend Piotr Walsh said that we have to assist African countries to control their population growth, the demographic uh, ex uh, explosion in these countries, I agree with him, but then please we have to call on our countries and our governments to fund UNFPA, the United Nations Population Fund, which lacks funds because the, the American administration under President Trump and Pence have cut the funds. So we have to uh, make, follow actions to the words. That's what uh, I wanted to say here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, Jean Bizet, France. Thank you, Chairman. The European response to the migratory crisis uh, through a beefed up control of our external borders and a full rollout of the Frontex mandate increased cooperation with countries of origin and transit, but also a more secure uh, Schengen information system. Uh, Frontex is creating a border and coast guard force and this force will be able to carry out uh, controls both at the external border and the Schengen area. Hotspots have been a positive development to identify and register people in trying to enter the Schengen area. But the question of returns is still outstanding. We need to consider hotspots in third countries themselves to try and limit upstream irregular migration within the Schengen area. Alongside the agreement with Turkey signed in March of last year, we need to look at improved readmission agreements. We need to look at global partnership with countries of origin and transit of migrants. This policy needs to be supported beyond the readmission agreements currently in force. The idea is to create a dissuasive effect to limit departures to Europe. We also need to note the difficulties in concluding such agreements and compromises need to be sought with Nigeria in particular uh, under the spirit of the Valletta Agreement from 2015. Uh, Frank Trucic uh, from Slovenia, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, what we are talking about, in fact, that we are talking about migrations. We are talking about political economy. Human trafficking uh, have been for ages, for decades, integral part of global, European, regional economies. We can talk about agriculture, construction, house help, textile industry, not only about prostitution and uh, picketing money on the streets. It's fact. Two-thirds of all human trafficking in European Union is internal one. It's also fact. Talking about uh, Africa, you know, we have some wars in Africa due to this, smartphones, due to metals we need for them. In fact, we have some wars in Africa which are wars of mining corporations with, you know, states behind them and diplomacy and so on which use ethnical and religion differences just for such kind of wars. So to conclude, uh, without different political economy, we are not even start to solve the issue and the problem we are talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Dear colleagues, Europe can certainly be proud to be a safe harbor for a great number of to those who are looking for a safe place. It's better than Australia or Canada or the United States. One of the reasons, certainly, is the geographical reason. Even though it is dangerous to get across the Mediterranean, it is still easier than to go over to the US or Australia. So my question, perhaps uh, to Mr. Mordieu, would be the following. 
when Europe is preparing, and I believe it is a good step forward, and we've supported that in our Senate, if we are looking for legal ways to get refugees over without them having to go across the Mediterranean themselves, which is very dangerous, couldn't we be engaged in discussions with the US, Australia, Canada, for them to take a similar approach so that they would also be helping those in need. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Ms. Ioannetta Cavadia from Greece, please. Mr. Chair, dear colleagues, let's admit that something is really wrong with the EU approach towards migration. It is seen as something menacing, a threat and a danger to be prevented or possibly an invasion to be combated. It indicates a total failure to address the root causes of migration and refugee flows towards Europe. Poverty, war, tyranny, climate change. It fails to address the issue as a phenomenon of truly historical proportions that will change the face of Europe in this century and prefers to see it as a so-called crisis, something exceptional and temporary that can be dealt with the policies of fortress Europe. I come from Greece and I wonder, are we proud of the European achievements in this field? Are we proud that Europe is giving money to states like Libya explicitly in order to prevent and combat the flows of migrants towards the continent? Do we accept the fact that what this means in practice is concentration camps in the Libyan desert, pushbacks in the Mediterranean Sea and auctions in Libyan cities where Africans are once again sold as slaves? Europe has failed miserably. It is extremely doubtful if there is room for a policy change that would encompass a humanitarian approach based on solidarity between member states and the protection of human rights, in other words, on principles that are legally blinding on the EU. However, those political forces that always called for such a policy <laughs> will continue to struggle for it. Next speaker is uh, Ara Maximos Karakopoulos, Krekastas. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the refugee migration problem uh, may not be in the front pages uh, any longer, but uh, it's still having a considerable impact, especially in Greece. Uh, Greece is at the front line, and we bear a considerable uh, part of the weight. We have 62,000 refugees and migrants currently as a result of the latest flow, and uh, there's a consistent flow from the Turkish coast. The situation on the Greek islands of the eastern Aegean is explosive. Migrants and refugees are multiplying, and problems are multiplying too. Uh, the residents are protesting because they uh, see that their presence is becoming more permanent. There are indesirable behaviors as well. For, on the 5th of December, uh, residents uh, from the island of Lesbos are going to protest in Athens because they don't want to see their island turned to a uh, prison uh, instead of a, an island of solidarity. So in this context, uh, Europe has to act decisively and show solidarity instead of covering up. Because if this goes on, we will be confronted with situations that are out of control. So we insist on an equitable distribution of these refugees all over the EU. Uh, this has to be implemented finally uh, and impose measures, if necessary, towards those countries that will not comply. Second, Turkey must respect uh, the agreement that signed with Europe and accept all requests for readmission without blackmailing us uh, through visas uh, in this case. Uh, Ivan Ivanov, Bulgaria. Mr. Ivan Ivanov from Bulgaria. Dear colleagues, the increased pressure on EU countries has uh, created the need for a comprehensive and coordinated approach by the EU, its agencies and the member states to manage migration process and tackle migration processes. Return policy is a fundamental comp component of European efforts to tackle the challenges of migration, but at the same time it's important to adopt a coordinated and sustainable approach that will ensure fair and accessible procedures <coughs> for persons who need international protection to be granted asylum in the EU and other host countries. It's important to continue the active implementation of a set of measures aim aimed at combating traffickers and smugglers with the constant involvement of countries of origin and transit and the participation of EU agencies. As you know, Bulgaria is an external border of the EU and strictly fulfills the commitments on this line. In connection with the above 
<coughs> we believe that the change in political obstruction and perspectively the country succession to Schengen and also, also relevant revision of Dublin uh, agreement will significantly improve the implementary of this uh, tough commitment. Thanks. Thank you. Next, uh, Mr. Sergio Patelli, Italy. Grazie mille. Thank you very much. Managing the phenomenon of migration across Europe is the Achilles heel that prevents people from believing that Europe is entirely coherent. We have physical and legal standards within Europe, but there, some of these are trying are being attacked and may be broken down. Beefing up our external borders does not mean that we can ignore problems that remain outside of them. Europe has staked its credibility on the migration problems. Some countries have done so much, an awful lot. Uh, they have kept faith in the principles of the Union. But uh, there is a moment in time when we do have to ensure that we can stand tall. Uh, we have to ensure that the partner states are resilient and that there is internal coherence. Uh, people seeking to leave their home country uh, and managing this problem is something that we have to do together. It cannot be left to one member state, but must be a truly union policy. It has been discussed, but we don't have a solution as yet. We have to ensure that we can efficiently manage problems that are clearly defined. We've not reached a, pro a point of no return, but we are getting ever closer. We have to ensure that the migration problem is not a threat. Thank you, Mr. Malik Osmani, the Netherlands. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. We focus today on the external dimension, but the biggest challenge for us is, of course, the internal dimension. It's all about solidarity. Tusk wants to start a debate with our government leaders next month, and its ambition is to have consensus in May next year. Is that realistic, according the, to the Commission, I asked Mr. Mardiu. And what is his view to solve this issue quickly in the European Union? And what is his advice to Mr. Tusk, and maybe also to us as a member states? And when we talk about the external dimension, one of the key issues for many years has been the return policy. Countries like, for example, Somalia, Ethiopia, Iraq, they refuse us when we want to return their citizens who are not refugees. We must act together as the European Union and make a big fist. It must have consequences. Why, Mr. Mordio, is it so difficult to have results on this issue? After all, it has been a key issue on our EU and migration agenda of the European Commission since 2015. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. And the last one is our neighbor from Finland, Kimmo. Uh, Mr. President, we uh, have a, a correct uh, picture of the situation and uh, good intentions to solve the problem. However, on the level of action, we have not made sufficient program, progress. It is true that uh, migration uh, flows to, towards Europe will continue because uh, climate change, uh, uh, draft, etc. will not go away. We need to uh, discuss the, this issue uh, without uh, uh, aggressions uh, calmly. And uh, societies need to address the problems relating to migration. We know that not all migrants uh, travel bona fide, and there are uh, many um, uh, side uh, phenomenon to this, but we do need to defend everybody's uh, dignity and human rights. Uh, however, we mustn't be naive in doing so. We have to be extremely responsible. Human trafficking is, in addition to uh, drug trafficking, one of the most disgusting phenomena of our times. 
Thank you all. And now the floor goes back to our speakers in order to comment the debate. We have uh, 10 minutes maximum for all of this. So three minutes per speaker now. And in the order of the presentations, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Sian Montu. Okay, I think this is an impossible task, so let me apologize in advance <laughs> to those of you in the audience who I offend by not being able to reply to your questions. Uh, a few quick points. I do think we need much, much more consistency at the EU level. We have a problem when we have, for example, variations in recognition rates for asylum seekers from Afghanistan with 1% average rate in one country and 99% in another country. This is where I do think the transformation of the asylum office in Malta into an asylum agency better able to bring convergence into play and ensure consistency will have an important role to play. Um, I want to challenge uh, one or two speakers who've said we're pouring money to the Libyan authorities. Not to the best of my knowledge, we're not. We're actually providing support to the UN organisations, UNHCR, IOM, UNICEF, to make a difference on the ground. Yes, we've been working with the Libyan Coast Guard, but to conduct search and rescue operations and rescue people who are otherwise drowning in the territorial waters of Libya. We've also been providing human rights training to the same people. If I look again at Turkey, this is not money that's being provided to the Turkish government. This is money that's being provided to make a difference for refugees. And our funding has, for example, ensured that over one million children are now able to be in full-time education and that two million Syrians have had their health costs covered. And for Mrs Leichen, I just want to assure you that a human rights-based approach is at the heart of all that we do. Um, uh, we fully are in respect of our commitments. There's no policy of refoulement, uh, and we're doing everything that we should in accordance with the rules that govern our actions. I think it was Mrs De Santa raised the particular question of unaccompanied minors. I think it's very important. We have a particular focus on children. One third of all the migrants who have arrived in the European Union in the last year, the refugees, are unaccompanied minors. We need to make sure we've got adequate reception facilities, adequate guardianship arrangements in place. The demographic situation in Africa is a concern. We have, for example, the average age of people in Niger is 14. We need to work with our African partners to create opportunities but also draw their attention to the challenge this presents to them. I think it was Mr Craigwell that said we need to make a clearer distinction between refugees and economic migrants. That needs to be at the heart of everything we do. Equally, I think one of our challenges now is to use some of the opportunities from the 44 billion euro investment program to also target vocational training professional development in our partner countries, perhaps linking this in as well to some of the circular migration um, offers we have. Um, I do want to put on place here, just on the record, I, I feel very uncomfortable with a cheap analogy that migrants or refugees are the cause of uh, security and terrorism threats. Unfortunately, all of the studies that we have show that homegrown terrorism is a much more um, threat to the European Union than refugees. Um, I wanted to just take the intervention of Mrs Kovac from Serbia just to put on the record my tribute to the efforts of the Western Balkans. I think Serbia and the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia in particular have showed their real value and partnership uh, approach and have been also benefiting from significant support from the European Union. I think it was Madam Tangway that raised smugglers. Let me just put on the record, we're doing an awful lot of work with Europol, turning it into a clearinghouse for information. I, I chaired a meeting recently, for example, with Europol, Interpol, the International Criminal Court, European Border and Coast Guard Agency, to make sure we can go after the financial flu flows and really start to aggressively dismantle the smugglers' networks, increasingly in partnership with some of our African countries. Um, I do think we need a global approach. Um, just on the situation on Greece, the, the situation is difficult on the islands. We're doing an awful lot of work together with the Greek authorities to support the Greek authorities in ensuring now the completion urgently of winterization. If I may, I, I do think equally it's quite important that Greece on its side ensures a more efficient approach in the appeals. Uh, system and that effective returns to Turkey can take place. We've only had 2,000 returns to Turkey and this is being exploited by the smugglers who use this as part of their narrative that you should still carry on paying for your journey to Greece because you will not be returned to Turkey. Um, let me come to Mr Asmani. Why no results on return? It's a complex matter. Our partners don't like it. But I think you are right to suggest that perhaps the solution is a much more joined-up effort where we are using as well some of the leverage we have on the European Union side. I think there is a fresh determination on this. And this explains why in the last few months we've been able to successfully reach return arrangements with Bangladesh, with Guinea and a number of other partners. I'll end with the question of the... 
um, internal reform, the reform of the common European asylum system. I think the challenge here is to, to do all that we can to seek to reach consensus and to have as broad a consensus as possible. For me, it's a difficult uh, balancing act between responsibility on the one hand, solidarity on the other hand. Um, I do think we need to be alert to and be sensitive to some of the political and cultural sensitivities that are here. But at the same time, I do believe that the European Union is a, a, a program, a project, a notion based upon solidarity and also based upon the respect for the rule of law. Thank you very much. And now the floor goes to uh, Mr. Edward Samit Lewis. Thank you very much. I will be uh, speaking in, in my mother tongue, Maltese, please. So, uh, I would like to thank you all for your comments. You raised very interesting points. I think I would like to thank the representative from the uh, European Parliament, so, uh, Mr. Tuna Callum, who together with Mr. Batelli said that the situation at the beginning involved Italy and Malta who were facing this problem from the they've been we'd been facing this problem um for years and we we were saying from the very beginning that this was a european problem and we you had to address this problem together in a holistic manner we couldn't address uh, this problem alone we need to also focus on investment the Valletta summit was also a very important milestone. We uh, there was aftermath afterwards, and uh, we went. We continued working on this uh, point to st stabilize the countries in the African continent. We need to invest in these countries, and uh, another. Um, comment from uh, Mr. Bizet and another comment from Mr. Cellini, who also commented on the investment that needs to be done. Another comment from uh, Ms. Tangi, we cannot look at, at Africa as an endemic problem. They are our partners, not um, a problem. They are a partner in this process where we need to move ahead together and solve this migration problem together. There was another uh, issue pointed by um, an MP from Greece, Ms. Kavad Kavadia. Europe does not have uh, structures that can answer promptly to any problems that or crisis that arise. This is a very complex problem. We are a neighbor country. We have very uh, close links, uh, close trade and political links with these countries. We've got different tribes in different countries in North Africa. However, we need to continue moving together um, on this issue. Um, we are a very small country, um, uh, and we need to work together to solve this problem. To be able to address this issue, we need to, on a global level, not just on a European level, address this uh, the human displacement. Therefore, we need to find global solutions and not just European solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Dear colleagues, uh, thank you very much for your observations. And uh, as we know, the question of managing migration is very complex. And for complex questions, there are not simple answers. So especially when we understand that a large-scale large migration will be with us for many years. And as discussed today, my, migration is like a puzzle with a lot of pieces. So we will need to find a, a real consensus and effective measures how to address root causes, manage external border, give development aid, combat trafficking, make return policies work, and to succeed in integration. And at the t same time, not to give up our core values. So uh, as a conclusion, I would like to remind all of us, united we stand, divided we fall. Thank you.
thank you to all our speakers and thank you for this lively debate. I totally agree with the Cypriot delegate that uh, one and a half minutes per speaker, of course, is not sufficient to tackle um, this issue uh, substantially. But as we all know, all big issues are solved with uh, little steps at a time. And I hope that we made this small step towards a better mutual understanding and uh, that we now know that uh, it's a problem that we have to solve all together. So thank you all and hopefully Bulgaria can now uh, give or take this issue forward. Thank you. Thank you, your colleagues. Now let us move on to our final agenda point. First of all, I will give you some information on yesterday's COSAC chairperson's meeting. We decided to appoint Mr. Kenneth Kermy as the new COSAC permanent member for the period 2018-2019. So congratulations, Mr. Kermy. And I would also like to thank Christiana Frieda on behalf of all of us for her contribution as the permanent member of COSAC during the last four years. I believe that we owe her an applause. Colleagues, now we have reached the point when we should adopt the contribution and conclusions of the 58th COSAC plenary. English. The first draft text of the contribution and conclusions was circulated to delegations on 13 November and the second draft on the 26 November. Over the past few days we have discussed and improved the text of the final contribution and conclusions in various formats among the presidential troika and the meeting of the chairpersons of COSAC. And I am delighted that we agreed on a revised text which was circulated on the delegations today. Hopefully we can agree on the emerged consensus and therefore adopt the contribution and the conclusions of the 58. Kosak, does everybody agree? Thank you. Now the final contribution and conclusions are adopted. Uh, Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, for the last two days we have been discussing a number of important topics. We have spoken about the future of the EU, we have spoken about how to communicate with our citizens on the EU issues, we also spoke about the digital single market and developing e-services. In today's morning session, we got a good overview on how a effective and sustainable security union is being developed, and we just finalized the debate on the external dimension of migration. I would like to express my sincere thank you to all the speakers and delegates for your constructive input and a high-quality debate during those two days. 
I would also like to thank everybody who contributed to the successful organization of this conference. And before I close our meeting, I am glad to pass the floor to our Bulgarian colleague who will taking over the task of organizing the Cossack work. So, Mr. Vigenin, please. Congratulations, Thomas, and all Estonian colleagues for the successful presidency and the excellent organization of both events of Cossack in Tallinn. I'm looking forward to continue our cooperation, now being in the driver's seat as of 1st of January next year. Dear colleagues, uh, participants in the plenary, your active participation has made this meeting a success, and I will be happy to welcome you in Sofia next year for the Chairperson's Cossack on 21st and 22nd of January, and the Plenary Cossack on 17th, 18th and 19th of June. Allow me now to offer a symbolic present to our host uh, before we close our session. So, thank you once again. Uh, before we can move on to lunch, I would like to draw your attention to a, a practical matter. The buses will be waiting for you in front of the house at 2 o'clock and they will take you back to your hotels. See you soon. <laughs>